Well, next month will mark the 81st anniversary of FDR signing Executive Order 9066, sealing the fate of more than 120,000 Japanese Americans living on the West Coast. Families were rounded up and sent to one of 10 internment camps all across the country. Their only crime, they looked like the enemy. But a small group of Bay Area families were able to escape the camps and live free in the state of Utah in an area called Keatley Valley. It is an untold story that very few people know about. It's also personal because it's my family was there. Careful. It's just, uh, just down this way. What if you could follow a road that led to a path, a path that opened the door to your past? After you're done. What do you think you would find? Oh, here. It's all part of a journey, a man rediscovering himself, a father sharing his story with his son, that father who just happens to be my dad. What about that photo there? Which one's you? Me. I'm the munchkin, back row. Third from the right, yeah. That's the suspenders. Yeah, hanging onto my suspenders. Apparently the photo was taken by some journalist. Because, hmm. oh. see, the Japanese did not have cameras. They're yeah. all confiscated. Is that why there's not that many photos? Yeah, I think so. The rare childhood photo of my father, a snapshot of a much bigger piece of American history. On December 7, 1941, Imperial Japan bombed Pearl Harbor, thrusting the United States into World War II. I was four years old when, when the war started. All of a sudden, the Japanese were not Japanese, they were Japs. That was in the newspaper, uh, newsreels, radios, you know, it's Japs, Japs, Japs. As the U.S. government rounded up 120,000 Japanese Americans and imprisoned them into one of 10 camps across the country, my father's family turned to this man, Fred Wada, an Oakland produce owner who refused to go to the camps and decided to gather a group of 130 family members and friends and travel to the state of Utah to an area called Keatley Valley. When they arrived in Keatley, it was snow packed. When the snow melted, they expected to farm the land, but it was all rocks, rough. In fact, there's a picture of the men trying to clear the field and behind it was a bulldozer just to clear the rocks. Life was hard, but they were free. Why go to Keatley? Why not go to camps? I know my parents, they had their reasons, real heavy reasons. He was an illegal alien. My mother expected my father to be arrested. And this little known story all but washed away when in 1987, the state of Utah built this dam flooding Keatley Valley and destroying any remaining remnants of the colony. It's a unique part of history, and it's right here in our backyard. But a few years ago, the city of Hideout, with the help of city council member Chris Beyer, wanted to bring the Keatley Valley story back to life. So this is the trail signage. Where if you now hike around the lake, the history will literally guide we you. We added Waterway, and this is Waterway West, and Keatley, which is Keatley West. We want everyone to know that this actually happened. American citizens were rounded up and forced to give up their homes and their possessions and relocate in a way that is unimaginable to some of us. And we don't want to forget that that happened. And to make sure those who visit the Jordanelle Reservoir don't forget, they also put up photos and listed the names of every member of the Keatley Valley Colony. So here's Grandpa. Yeah, look at that, 29 years old. Grandma. 25. You were four. Four. Then, then and my sister. Auntie was four, uh, four, four months. months. A chance for survivors like my father to retrace and then pass along their personal story. Any emotions seeing this? Well, kind of tongue-tied. Yeah. 
So what, what does that make me, part of history? You, you're historical, man. <laughs> uh, wow. And in part two of our story tomorrow, I'm going to introduce you to some of the last remaining survivors, only nine of them, of the Keatley Valley Colony, including one who's 95 years old. She's, she's a hoot. Um, <laughs> and it. you'll also learn more about that man, Fred Wadda. He's the Oakland produce owner who led that group. His daughter, Mary, actually lives in Benicia, and she's now the keeper of his story. But um, it was nice to, to do this story with my yeah. father. You know, I think as journalists, we're not used to doing stories about ourselves mm -hmm. or having the cameras pointed at ourselves. Mm -hmm. But... I've known about this story since I was in college. Mm -hmm. It's been on my mind for 30 years. Wow, and now you finally and, get and to And to tell finally it. see it on TV, that's, it, it, it means a lot to me, and I know it means a lot to my dad. Oh my goodness, and yeah, just to have him kind of revisit that mm -hmm. spot with you, it must have been such a great bonding yeah. experience. And, and, my, and my brother came, my cousins came, oh, my, wow. my, my auntie was there, my mom was, I mean, so the family came, and it was, it was, it was nice to just experience that. And then meet all the other families, too. Yeah. Well, I mean, what struck me is just how brave that group was to it, be able it, to They're courageous. To, uh, to unbelievable. Just to tell the government, nope, we're just going to leave. And, and they made it. Yeah. A lot of people tried, and, and they were sent to prison. Yeah, they didn't have anything. They were like, yeah. we're going to start from scratch here, and we're going to make this work. Mm -hmm. Pretty remarkable. Love that story. Thank you. Thanks for sharing it.